In the first video, we looked at place. We looked at whether places have spirits, whether they're some kind of beings, whether mountains have a spirit and lakes and so on. And that's quite easy to say yes to. Your home feels different to a river, feels different to a beach, feels different to a mall. What about objects? In this video, we're going to look at objects. Do they have a spirit? Do all objects have a spirit or just some of them? And if so, how do you tell the difference between them? And if some of them do, why do we even call them objects? Let's talk about it. In between Lake Mungo and the next major destination in this animism exploration series, I needed somewhere to stop to wash some clothing, upload some videos, recharge batteries, that kind of thing. And uh, although this may surprise the uh, Australians among us, I chose Canberra. I chose the nation's capital. Why that's surprising for the rest of you will become a little bit obvious later on in the video. Now, this turned out to be a really good place to explore objects and whether some of them are people, whether they have a spirit, whether they can do things on their own, which is to say have agency. So we're talking about that in this video. And I was going to film this one there in Canberra, like I did with Lake Mungo. But another shoe hadn't dropped. When you're making a series like this, you were doing it in combination with place. Uh, that's implied in an animist approach. It's not just me having a thought and expressing it through uh, YouTube to you. And it, a shoe hadn't dropped. I'm like, it doesn't, doesn't feel right. Canberra wasn't the right place to talk about objects. Uh, and then at the end of this little journey, if you can tell I'm back on the farm, at the end of this little journey, I had a few days in Melbourne and I went and saw the Titanic exhibition. Yes, I'm as surprised as you. It was about the ship, <laughs> not about the movie. But that, as we continue an accidental exploration of museums, brings up a point that was necessary to open this video with. This is the other shoe uh, to drop. What makes... Titanic objects, anything more than sea junk. I live on a little island. I live in Tasmania. So when I go for a walk along the beach, occasionally you see stuff that's been washed up because we have uh, really done a number on the oceans. And it's stuff from shipwrecks. It's stuff that's fallen overboard. Uh, that's the same thing that I was playing with. I even got to touch the hull uh, of the Titanic, which actually was kind of cool. I'm not going to lie. But why was it cool? What is it about the stuff that I see at the Titanic exhibition in Melbourne that makes it more than just pollution in the ocean in the same way that the old bits of fishing rope that I see as I walk along the beach don't have that same story. So this is about objects. This is about, well, hang on, something happened to one of them and not the other as far as we know. Now, the bit of rope that I might see on the beach probably has its own story and can be considered a different class of object. But in this one, we're talking about well, Marxist notions of primitive accumulation. What is it about objects that can accrue status to them? The way we treat so-called objects inside materialism itself breaks materialism. There should be no inherent magic, no inherent spirit in the old little bits of bolts and plates and things that have been pulled up from the Titanic that I got to see in Melbourne. And the junk that I see walking along the beach. But there is, and you know there is. And the next step, if I uh, ask you, well, what is it about these objects that has a certain kind of magic? You have to use magical language to describe it. And in the case of the Titanic, because funnily enough, I got to think about this on a boat trip, <laughs> the third shoe to drop uh, for this video on the, back, on the way back to Tasmania is it's a ghost story. It is literally a ghost story. So there's something about the Titanic that is archetypally powerful because it's a Tower of Babel story. It's, it's, uh, it's an arrogance. But it's also a ghost story. Like I got to touch the, the hull of a ghost ship. And that really brings in what we call objects and how um, the realms of the dead and the realms of the living are all interpenetrated. On the way to Lake Mungo, I stopped by the stupa of infinite compassion, which is the largest 
uh, outdoor stupa in the Western or Western world, Western hemisphere. I forget. It's one of the biggest. And it's somewhat improbably outside of a Victorian country town named Bendigo. And here we have another accumulation of haunted objects. Uh, really elevated and powerful and wonderful. It was a wonderful place to to visit. It has the the largest gem quality jade Buddha in the world. And if you understand anything about stupas, if you know what they are, this is a Neolithic survival. So a stupa is quite literally an accumulation of haunted objects. It's an accumulation of relics of some kind uh, within, we know them mostly from Buddhism, but truly it's it's Neolithic. There, there is a direct unbroken line in between burials with Neolithic burials with status goods and a stupa. So there is something about the bringing together of objects that has story that generates power. And somewhere that, uh, like the stupa, you can feel that. You can feel this is a place of sacred objects and a place of meditation and reverence. It's wonderful. If you're in the area, look it up. The behavior of accruing haunted objects to generate some kind of power or status is long-lived and is expressed even by uh, ostensive materialists. So when it comes to national capitals, and Canberra is a good example because it's new. It's only about a hundred and something years old. And we'll come to the story of Canberra in a moment. But it has the National Gallery. It has the National Museum. It has an accumulation of valuable objects all in one place that is also the place of state power. So if you think about how kings and queens, even modern ones, behave today, they accumulate jewels <laughs> and artworks and, and objects. And, but why certain objects and not others? Why was Hitler after the um, Spear of Destiny and not just some Roman spear? Uh, what are we what are we doing? What are we saying about objects when we accumulate them? And what are we saying about a, the accumulation of powerful objects and the expression of state power? Why some paintings and not others? Why this rock and not that rock? And why do we associate, let's say, kingship or statehood with great mounds of valuable objects? And I think one of the craziest or most jarring examples of a state uh, primitively accumulating objects is when those objects are already living beings. So Canberra has a national arboretum. This is truly and genuinely an accumulation for status reasons of living beings, of trees, of plants. There are dozens of bonsai. There are hills growing with Canadian maple and Tibetan fir trees. And it's a cool place to visit, not, not going to lie. I mean, I like trees, I like plants. But what's happening here? What, what spell is going on here where we accumulate so-called objects uh, for status, for state appeal, state status, even when those objects aren't even objects? By a biological definition, they're an organism. They, they satisfy a separate category inside materialism, let alone animism. And for me, on the trip to Canberra, that was the place where the the hypocrisy or the irregularities between the official narrative of materialism and how we live, which I genuinely think is uh, animist, uh, and unless we make the effort to do otherwise, that's where it was at its most extreme, where the accumulation of objects to bolster state power includes not just objects by a materialist definition, but organisms. So why Canberra becomes an accidentally really good place to explore objects as beings and objects with agency and power and story and, and, and ghost objects is this: the city itself is a mandala. And to explain that, it seems, I guess, only appropriate in an episode about personhood and objects to ask ChatGPT for the history of Canberra as a design, as a mandala. The choice of Canberra as the site for an Australian capital was the result of a protracted dispute between Sydney and Melbourne, Australia's two largest cities, each vying to be the nation's capital following federation in 1901. 
The rivalry necessitated a compromise. A new capital would be established in a location that was not too close to either city. The criteria for this new location included it being at least 100 miles from Sydney, and the territory in which it was situated would have a minimum area of 100 square miles. Canberra was selected in 1908 based on several factors. It offered a temperate climate, a central location within New South Wales, which was a significant consideration given the state's economic and population dominance at the time, and aesthetic appeal with its natural landscape. Additionally, the site was strategically located, deemed defensible, and possessed an adequate water supply, which were all important considerations in the early 20th century. The design of Canberra was entrusted to Walter Burley Griffin, a Chicago-based architect, following an international design competition in 1911. Griffin's design was selected from 137 entries and it was celebrated for its innovative and visionary urban planning principles. Griffin, along with his wife and professional partner, Marion Mahoney Griffin, envisioned Canberra as a city in a landscape, integrating urban development with the natural features of the land. Their plan featured geometric motifs such as circles, hexagons and triangles, and was centered around a grand axis, now known as the land axis, aligning significant landmarks and natural features. Walter Burley Griffin's interest in theosophy, a spiritual movement popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that sought to explore the underlying unity of the world and the interconnectedness of all things, significantly influenced his work on Canberra. Now, I don't actually think that's a good definition of theosophy, but who am I to argue with the robot? Uh, it's obviously germane if we're talking about the plan of a city. Theosophy's emphasis on harmony, both in the spiritual and material worlds, can be seen in Griffin's design philosophy for Canberra. His plan sought to embody these ideals, creating a city that was not only functional, but also spiritually uplifting. Griffin's design reflected theosophical principles through its emphasis on unity, the integration of the city with the natural landscape, and the inclusion of symbolic geometrical shapes. These elements were intended to create a sense of balance and harmony within the urban environment, aligning with the theosophical belief in the importance of achieving equilibrium between the spiritual and physical realms. On the one hand, I was going to say, well, that didn't work, if, if I think certainly over the last few years, but just in general, any Western states. Uh, Australia in the 20th century was, um, well, let's just say deeply and famously racist, and then during the last few years, uh, famously totalitarian. But the other side of that, you could make the case, it's like, yes, but imagine if Canberra wasn't built like a mandala, how much worse it could have been. And uh, I have no argument. <laughs> Do you see the mandala half full or half empty? That's on you. But consider how a mandala of people and buildings and status objects inside them is a story of the relationality and accumulation and animist relations of of objects and people in place so it's turned out to be quite a a, a good <laughs> accidentally good example of exploring object and what we do with them and whether we think they are beings or whether we think they have special power and like all capitals i suppose canberra has lots of museums and these are part of the trooping of state color. So the objects themselves are put to work propagandizing for the state. I know there are similar things in other Western countries, but in Australia, every primary school kid anywhere in the country, I don't know if this still happens, but it certainly was the case when I was a child, went to Canberra. You get bus down to Canberra and you see the Parliament House and uh, sporting facilities and... National Gallery, National Museum, and so on. And I like you look at it with older anarchist eyes, and you understand that you're being indo indoctrinated into state religion. It was still a fun trip uh, <laughs> because being away from the parents and whatever is always exciting. But the museums are doing something other than generating a field of status and power that we put our politicians on top of. They're also being press ganged into demonstrating that power uh, into the next generation. Now, Marx has this idea called primitive accumulation. And like a lot of Marx has thought, there's something good in there that he kind of gets wrong. Uh, he gets primitive wrong. I think he uses examples that are too modern, which are nevertheless the story of the development of capitalism. So the Highland Clearances and the English or British Ex Enclosure Acts. He considers that primitive accumulation, which it is in a way, but I consider primitive accumulation to be the famous 
giant stone money of the Micronesian island of Yap, uh, the the much more much more truly primitive accumulation, the Kohinoor diamond in the British crown, uh, the Stone of Destiny, uh, the same thing, because these do the same thing that a national gallery and sporting institutes do to school kids, right? It's the demonstration of the power of uh, the British throne, the British crown. So I think primitive accumulation is uh, older than when Marx picks up the idea, but he does have some examples of it. And why, why I think this is useful to think with is in my book, in Animistic, we open exploring the idea of a, uh, a French philosopher and academic by the name of Bruno Latour, who says, we have never been modern. And I just want to read you that because I, um, I open this, I open the book with it because it's, it's absolutely the right way of breaking the inherited notion that objects are just dead material things by realizing that we've never, even though we say that, the stories of state capitals, the stories of primitive accumulation demonstrate that even as uh, imperial materialism marched across the planet, we've never been in relation to objects in a way that is non-primitive, right? And I want to bring, this is why I open the book with it, trouble to the word primitive versus modern, which is Bruno Latour's whole point. It's like, oh, you think you're so fancy. Uh, you are, and it's a way of elevating and breaking that enlightenment racial divide. Uh, there's no time when you haven't been savage, and that's a good thing. So off we go to um, Bruno Latour's famous observation that we have never been modern, that we begin the book proper. This, it's an introduction. Modernity is itself a collection of claims about the past that it invented, as well as a salvationist faith in technological progress as mankind's redeeming deity, and yet it passes itself off as a clean and coherent alternative to messy primitivism. So the Enlightenment tells a story that it's the smart one that's worked out stuff, and everything before it is primitive and savage. And if you just allow it to continue being smart, um, it will develop and progress in an ever enlightening way into the future. But it just, it just says that. It is a claim about reality that is unsubstantiated, right? Uh, Latour describes the uneasy settlement reached between science, politics, ethics, and other citadels of the Enlightenment. So this is the Latour quote. First, a world untouched by human hands and impervious to human history. Second, a mind isolated inside uh, its own head, striving to gain access to absolute certainty about the laws of the world outside. Third, a political world down there, clearly distinct from the mind inside, which is agitated by fads and passions, flares of violence and eruptions of desires, collective phenomena which can be quieted down only by bringing in the universal laws of science, and fourth, a sort of position up there that serves as a warrant for the clear separation of the three spheres above, a view from nowhere occupied by either the god of ancient religions of the physicist, god who makes sure that there are always enough laws of physics to stop human beings behaving irrationally. This is me now. We have never been modern, which is the good news, as it should make it easier to leave the dominant metaphor of the cosmos as machine for the far more medicinal and probably true metaphor of the universe as living being. The goal is not to uncover what so-called indigenous cultures have to teach us in the modern world, to somehow find a voice of wisdom we have lost, but simply to relearn again how to hear, to unstop our own ears. So, Latour says we have never been modern. And you see that in our relationship, I think, most especially with so-called objects. Uh, and you see that in states that are explicitly materialist, behaving in ways that we would consider, and I mean, in, in, the, in the best possible sense, savage. So if we can't call objects objects, because to call something an object is to bring with it an entire belief system of materialism and, uh, and a meaningless universe, to objectify, to be out there and separate from oneself in a cosmos that is some kind of alive doesn't work. Uh, what do we say? Then? And somewhat like the place exploration uh, we did at Lake Mungo, whilst it's certainly better to say, okay, cool, then everything has a spirit. Uh, this camera has a spirit, um, you know, for various things on my desk, that mouse, uh, that lighter, they have spirits. Is It's better. But it's still not 
It's still not all the way to usefully true just yet. And let's take a hypothetical example, not that any of these knives have survived, but let's say an archaeologist digs up a Roman knife. Cool. A knife from Rome. Digs up a knife that is identical, but was used to stab Caesar. Why is one of them different to the other? Now, from a materialist basis, they're not, but they are. <laughs> this is one of the places where we break materialism. It's like, no, no, no. The, the knife that stabbed Caesar has story. And by story, I mean agency. It's done something in the cosmos. And that's the way to relating appropriately and usefully in a cosmos as a community of beings to what we, or you might have previously called objects. Uh, the simple question is, has it done something? And we get that divide from a uh, famous 20th century anthropologist by the name of Irving Hallowell, who learned it from his research among the uh, Ojibwa. And he asked, he was out with them uh, on country and asked, oh, so all rocks are people? All rocks have spirits? And his guide looks at him like, you're an idiot. Of course not. Uh, and the difference is, so the Stone of Destiny, which is used in British coronation, is a person in this context. But a rock, <laughs> if you look across at the hill <laughs> from the castle, uh, picking up a big rock from there, isn't a person yet. So the divide is between an object that does something versus an object that doesn't. I'm still using the word object because uh, we don't want to get too lost at just yet. And this is the right way of being in a cosmos that's a community of beings that is also in flow. To understand that there are agencies outside of the human is step two, I would say, in animism. Step one is to realize that the cosmos is a community of beings. Step two is that they're off doing things that often have nothing to do with humans. So those two awarenesses or those two aspects of awareness allow you to step outside of a object-based cosmos into one where some objects are beings, uh, some rocks are rocks, uh, and some rocks are beings. And that agency idea or notion is, returning to Canberra, complexified in a delightful way. Because we can say, for instance, that the whole project is artificial, that it is a spell of exclusively a spell of power, that this land was appropriated from the traditional custodians, true, and then a British imperial state was built and codified on top of it, which is then expressing in a hopefully eventually post-imperial, post-commonwealth context. That's all true. And part of this spell involves accruing to itself this self-declared authority um, objects that bolster its status. Uh, so the best galleries, the best museums, and so on. That's true. Don't get me wrong. That, that That's the spell of statehood. But particularly in an Australian context, and in, his, in the last 30 years in Canberra in particular, as the growing awareness of the horror of the colonial project actually does filter into government discourse, there is more... Uh, indigenous sacred stuff. I was going to say objects, but we're going to move outside of that. There's a Maori word, Taonga, which is closer. It is closer. It's, I should just use Taonga. Uh, and what happens when certain kind of living objects are given some of their agency back? So in the first video, the return of the physical human remains, a really good example of when an object plainly isn't an object of Mungo Man and Mungo Lady to the lake. But if you've read Starships, my first book, one of the things that we go into tremendous detail on is the Seven Sisters songline. So in Australia, the Pleiades story is held by a bunch of different Aboriginal nations uh, across the whole uh, continent, almost like a a skew with belt from the southwest uh, up to the northeast. And each different mob contains and, and shares and holds different parts of that sun line. And I forget when it was now, a while ago, 10 years, maybe more, there was a, uh, and it's still touring, I believe, but a 
Seven Sisters Songline Exhibition in Canberra, which was a spell. Uh, and it involved, uh, it was run by uh, Indigenous custodians, um, uh, Indigenous uh, museum keepers and so on, in conjunction with the, let's just say, wisdom keepers in the different nations uh, across the Songline itself. And these were brought together in a way that was um, allowed from a spirit perspective and from an elder perspective to transmit its medicine in in that kind of appropriate way. And I think about, I think it was about 10 years ago now, and I think about what that spell may have done uh, to uh, Australia to expedite the, post-colonial is too loaded a term, but to expedite the transformation that country needs to go through um, politically and ecologically here. I think about that. And that would not have happened had the accumulation of status objects and custodians of said status objects in a really primitive statecraft way not occurred. Never. So if there wasn't Canberra, there would not have been the greatest Seven Sisters songline spell potentially ever, but certainly in the last 40,000 years that is now um, touring the world. So this is a really good example when you step into, wait a minute, all right, so they're not objects. <laughs> well, some of them, some of them are beings and some of them have their own agency. So how do I operate in a world where yeah. I can notice that and, and participate in it? And I sit with that idea as I visit a touring expedition in Canberra, an ancient Egypt expedition. Now, a uh, bit of an Egypt nerd, my first book is largely about where Egypt got its uh, magical and star-based knowledge from. So a long-term Egypt nerd. And the quote-unquote objects in this traveling expedition were from a imperial power whose goods I'm less familiar with. So I'm obviously familiar with the, uh, the British Egyptian loot and the Italian Egyptian loot and to some extent the German uh, Egyptian loot but not so much the low countries, not the Dutch Egyptian loot. <laughs> and that is where uh, these objects, so-called, come from for the Ancient Egypt exhibition that is on in Canberra at the time of recording. And here's a really good example. I'm going to do a separate video about Hermeticism inspired by this. What are those objects doing now? In the same way that their accumulation of them is power for a state. That is probably still in play when you think about touring exhibitions being branding or advertising in the world of museums and secondarily the world of states that allow for that to happen. But it's certainly not the primary goal as it was with the British Museum uh, and the Ashmolean and so on. It was um, certainly for learning, but it was learning in the sense of um, London and Oxford shall be the um, the the center of learning, but also the place of definitions. The, this, this is how we tell you what things are. This was an interesting exhibition for a bunch of reasons. It didn't do any of that. There wasn't really a story. Uh, some of the stuff like this late period, uh, there's a bit of dynastic. What I did notice was there were was a lot of small objects in the ancient Egypt exhibition. So less at the big, there's no Rosetta Stone or big statues or any of the, the British Museum loot. It was small objects, which is more difficult and interesting to program, as in how do you display them? How do you display like a little comb and a little mirror in a way that is impressive to uh, to tourists, to visitors? Because uh, a big statues of Ramses, big, like that, that's going to be impressive when you walk into the room. So it was a really... Uh, fruitful place to sit with what objects so-called do in a modern, I don't want to say post-imperial context, but in a reanimizing world context. And there's something about Egypt's mission that is, and this is what the next video, well, a, a video, and it might be available now, check below. <laughs> uh, there's something about Egypt's destiny that is in its entirety hermetic. So, Hermeticism or hermetism is, broadly speaking, the bundling up of the wisdom of ancient Egypt into a portable package as, let's just say, the politics of um, 
dynastic and then uh, Hellenistic Egypt collapsed. So this exhibition is, by that definition, hermetic because it carries with it in a portable and object, but small object-centric way, the medicine of Egypt, the stories and invitations to uh, learning from its wisdom. And again, that would not have happened in Canberra had Canberra not been a spell of primitive accumulation, had our relationship to objects so called actually gone in a materialist direction rather than stayed in an animist one. An animist one where not all objects are persons, some of them are, and the way you tell is what are they doing? And in order to notice that, you have to allow for humans to not be the only players in this game, to not be the only actors on the stage. So as Bruno Latour says, we have never been modern, and that's a good thing.